Good morning um, and welcome to this webinar, What Makes a Tax Haven? I'm Juliet Garside and I'll be your chair today. I'm delighted to say we've got 120 people, I think, signed up um, for this event. Uh, and you've come in from all over the world in business, civil society, academia. So you're in good company. Um, this event is one of many uh, organized for Fair Tax Week 2023. It runs from the 8th to the 18th of June, and it's an initiative from the Fair Tax Foundation that recognizes the businesses and organizations uh, that promote responsible tax conduct. And it's also a celebration of the positive contribution that paying tax makes to society uh, and how it funds a huge array of public services from education to health to social care, flood defence, roads and, and policing. To find out more about Fair Tax Week and what else is happening, um, you can go to the website fairtaxmark.net. Um, so Fair Tax Week is also an opportunity to explore related issues. And we've got seminars on um, who owns what companies, uh, transparency around that. And, and today we'll be talking about tax havens. So I'll briefly introduce our speakers. We have the author and journalist, Oliver Bullock. We have uh, Florencia Lorenzo from the uh, Brilliant Tax Justice Network. Uh, we have Chiara Patatura from Oxfam EU, and um, last but not least, Jamie Boswell uh, from our organizers, uh, the Fair Tax Foundation. So a bit about me, I joined The Guardian in 2011 uh, as a technology reporter, and I became interested in tax at that point because I was looking at the accounts of big tech companies like Apple and Google and how they were offshoring um, and removing from tax the amazing profits they were making in big economies like the UK. Um, and then came wave after wave of big offshore leaks. So we looked at HSBC Swiss Bank uh, back in 2014 and then moved on to the Panama Papers in 2016, which really drilled down into how, how the British Virgin Islands uh, were playing uh, such a huge role in uh, hiding both corporate and mainly personal wealth from tax and from scrutiny, um, and uh, went on to look at many other leaks and other tax havens like Cyprus and Malta. So what makes a tax haven? I'll give you my take very briefly, and then we will ask our speakers. Um, so I would say there are three main um, things that, you, uh, that define a tax haven. So of course, low or zero tax on foreign companies that are registered in that jurisdiction. Um, and low or zero transparency around those companies. So who owns them? Um, uh, what information um, is held on the corporate, you know, no information on corporate registers about who owns a company, what its assets are, you know, financial accounts. And quite often, not always, um, but quite often a small uh, captive economy. So on the whole, a, a place like the British Virgin Islands or Cyprus, which depends really heavily on the income from the, from, from the management and setting up of these offshore companies, which we kind of have to remind ourselves are on the whole, not necessarily companies. Um, they may just be vehicles for holding a bank account or an asset like a jet or a yacht or a property. Um, I'd add one thing, we need to make a tax haven. we need the complicity of big economies like the UK. Our financial services industry has, um, really does benefit from the UK's extensive network of tax havens. Um, and those who profit from that obviously influence our politics. Um, tax havenry is growing. It's not, despite all the light we've shed on it at The Guardian and many other newspapers and media in recent years, um, uh, tax havenry is growing. So I think um, uh, some studies show that uh, in the 1970s, 2% of profits were shifted offshore. Today, it's more than a third by some measures. Um, private wealth that has shifted to, you take the British Virgin Islands, they have 30,000 inhabitants, but they have nearly half a million offshore companies. Um, and they're still being opened every year. Um, so the um, so enough from me, um, we'll move on to uh, our panel. 
uh, our fantastic panel, um, who will each talk for about 10 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A afterwards at which we really urge you to ask questions, and we'll take them in turn. Um, and um, I'll just um, uh, sum up at the end briefly. I think we've got until 1.30 um, for our talk. So um, let me start by introducing Oliver Bullo. Um, uh, he is a journalist and author who specializes in financial crime, in offshore, uh, in corruption and skullduggery, and uh, also in the former Soviet Union. So quite a brilliant array of subjects. Um, his recent books include uh, Butler to the World, uh, which was published last year and looks at how Britain became a servant to, to tycoons, tax dodgers, kleptocrats, and criminals. Um, thanks to, I'm sure it's offshore network and lively financial services industry. Um, Oliver, I'd um, like to perhaps start by asking you to talk us through um, how, when tax havens first emerged and why. Well, thank you, Julia, and really good to be here. Um, it's a really interesting question because if you go back to the origins of tax havens, you go back to a time when countries were prepared to call themselves tax havens. Uh, these days, it's uh, it's very much a derogatory term. No one would admit to being a tax haven. They are perhaps an international financial centre, but they're certainly not a tax haven. Everyone abides by the rules. But, you know, and, and to a certain extent, there have been tax havens as long as there has been free movement of money. You know, Switzerland has been in the tax haven game at least since the 1920s, if not before. Uh, Curaçao in the, um, the Dutch uh, colony in the um, Caribbean, certainly back to the 1940s. But really, the big movement into tax havens begins with the post-Second World War settlement when, um, under the Bretton Woods Agreement, there were tight restrictions on the movement of capital and very high taxes in most major Western economies to pay for the welfare state in the UK, the New Deal set up in the US, and similar arrangements in European countries. And that created a strong desire from wealthy citizens of those countries and large profitable companies to get their money out of the reach of those uh, taxes. And that led to a desire for alternatives. And that desire for alternatives was met by desire from often small jurisdictions to make a bit of a living um, uh, outside the sort of traditional ways of making a living in agriculture and so on. And this begins with places like Jersey, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, um, Monaco, Luxembourg, and then it becomes increasingly Baroque as you go into the 1970s and 1980s with places like the British Virgin Islands, of course, um, which are the Cayman Islands. Cayman Islands, you know, when it became separated from uh, the colony of Jamaica, when Jamaica became independent, the, the Cayman Islands was really only engaged in turtle fishing. It didn't have any significant economy at all. But because it was British, because it was looking for new ways of making a living and was still attached to the UK and the UK's financial system it became, you know, one of the largest financial centers in the world. Um, so, you know, tax havens offer uh, obviously low taxes, but also low scrutiny, um, uh, protection from litigation, often from creditors or, you know, for example, uh, divorced spouses, things like that. Basically, they, they provide any services at all to anyone with money um, that that uh, moneyed person wants. Um, they're often small countries because uh, if large countries engaged in this in a big way, they would probably lose out on more in taxes than they would gain in the fees that you earn from helping other people dodge taxes. But small countries don't have to worry about that. So often small islands or or small you know uh, uh, peripheral jurisdictions, but they're often allied to a big country uh, because there's quite a lot of pushback from big countries. So if, if a small place has diplomatic protection from a large jurisdiction, then it's able to stay in the game for much longer. I think this helps to explain why the British network of tax havens has been so successful for so long because it's been protected by the UK. But increasingly now we see different states in the United States who are offering products that no British tax haven offers. South Dakota is, is these insanely impenetrable trust structures which last forever. Um, no other tax haven offers anything like that. Um, the kind of secrecy available in Delaware is now far better than what's available in the British Virgin Islands and so on. Um, so, I mean, the history of tax havens is basically the history of globalization. As long as there's been the opportunity to move money between countries, there's been the opportunity to try and arbitrage the different things those countries offer to help you um, keep more of your money and have to pay less of it in tax or, or to reveal less of it to the authorities or indeed to pay 
uh, less of it to creditors if you end up owing someone something in a court of law. And Oliver, what what first brought you to start mm-hmm. writing about this um, this area? Um, and, and because I, I imagine when you began, it was much less of a thing, wasn't it? It was not very written about. Yeah, it was certainly um, not written about as much as it is now, which is one of the great developments. I think there's far more awareness of the harmful role that offshore centres play. Um, I lived in Russia and and travelled very widely in the former Soviet Union, and corruption was just an everyday fact of life for me and everyone I knew. You quite regularly got shaken down for bribes by police officers or officials or whatever. That was just part of life. Um, But the more I looked into how corruption worked, the more I realised that it wasn't just a phenomenon of ordinary police officers shaking down people on the street. It's an entire organized parallel state structure headed by ministers and the president himself. And the money, by the time it flows upwards, all of these little individual bribes have become colossal amounts of money. (laughs) And that money is not kept in Russia or Ukraine or Kyrgyzstan or whatever. It is spent overseas, often in London or other major Western countries on property, on on, um, mansions or football clubs or whatever. And I became fascinated by how that happened, how the money got from being collected in Russia or Ukraine to being spent in in London and essentially the the complicity of major Western countries in this process, because we normally talk of corruption as being a Nigerian problem or a Ukrainian problem or a a Chinese problem, when actually if the money is ending up in the US or the UK or France, it's as much a British, French or American problem as it is uh, the origin country. So it was those networks that I became really interested in. And um, they take it takes you to amazing places. Um, You know, I've been all over the Caribbean, essentially failing out to failing to find anything at all of interest, but having a great time while doing it. Um, Later this month, I'm going to the Pacific, where I'll be doing, I no doubt, the same thing. So, you know, it's a a fascinating uh, job that takes me to lots of interesting places, and I'm very happy to be able to do it. I mean, obviously, I would like it if by my revelations, I ended up shutting down the offshore world, Uh, but a little bit of me would also miss uh, the chance to go to places like Nevis and, um, you know, bang my head against their regulators and fail to find anything out. Well, the, the advantage of going to small places is you can meet everyone from the prime minister down um, and they're often happy to engage. Um, and uh, so to, to summarise, I think you've been over some of the points um, with my first question, but to summarise, what are the, the chief characteristics of a tax haven? Well, and, I mean, as they turn out to be um, small, but part of a larger whole. So um, often, uh, so we see Dubai, the development of Dubai, Dubai's ability to be part of the UAE is absolutely crucial to its role as a tax haven because it's the UAE is an important partner, partner for many countries and Dubai can sort of free load on that. Jersey is part, it's not part of the UK, but it's part of the British system. So is Gibraltar. Uh, South Dakota is part of the US system. Uh, Ireland now, uh, or the Netherlands, colossal European tax havens are part of the European Union. So it is not so much as it used to be a system of just an island in the middle of nowhere that sold secrecy and sold companies. It is now to being a node in the globalized economy, but a node with some form of protection. You know, in in Russian corruption terms, you refer to protection as being a krisha, a roof, um, as if it's something that protects you from the rain. Um, It feels a bit like that with tax havens now. They have to have a krisha, whether it's, you know, in South Dakota's case, you know, the US government, or in Jersey's case, the UK government, or in Ireland's case, the European Union. So that is, I think, the, the modern iteration of a tax haven is far more about a small part of one of the global blocks, uh, and far less about sort of a renegade jurisdiction like Anguilla back in the 1970s, that was just totally off the charts. Um, yeah, those places are, are, are really been squeezed out of business, because a lot of the response to tax havens from um, the major Western institutions like the OECD and the FATF, which you know deal with taxes and money laundering respectively, has been, you know, though nominally aimed at shutting down jurisdictions that engage in tax ev- tax evasion and money laundering, they've really been shutting down small jurisdictions that engage in those things. So if you're a large jurisdiction, no matter how guilty you are, you tend to get away with it. I mean, the sort of the almost uh, example of this is the ludicrous European Union tax haven blacklist. Um, which never includes any member of the European Union or never includes any country that is friendly to the European Union. So you end up with, you know, places like Mongolia being targeted or or Vanuatu, which, you know, um, they may be doing small things on the margin, but let's face it, they're not the problem. And, um, and, you know, it is, it is a sadly um, part of uh, the entire debate around tax havens that as long as a country is friendly with the major Western jurisdictions, you can get away with almost anything. Yes. And we have Chiara here who'll be telling us some more about that. 
uh, Oxfam have looked at the EU tax haven list quite closely. So um, uh, perhaps that, that leads on to uh, the next question, which is the final question, which is what can we do to, we know how they're made, but how do we unmake tax havens? Um, and is it about, um, is it really about targeting the sponsors, uh, the larger countries that protect tax havens rather than the havens themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing is to think about why we care. You know, we care, we don't care about tax havens per se, we care about the the, the crimes that they um, facilitate or enable. Um, and if we want to end those crimes, we really need to look at the origin countries where the money comes from, or the destination countries where the money ends up. Now, I don't think there's any mileage in expecting Russia to improve its ways. Russia will continue to be a kleptocracy as long as you know, Putin is in charge. But the, the, the destination countries, they can change what they do, they can prevent um, they don't have to accept this money anymore. And if you look at the actual mechanics of tax havens, often those major Western countries are far, far more embedded than they like to admit. Um, the Marshall Islands gets a lot of uh, bad stick at the moment for helping to um, the shadow fleet of Russian oil tankers moving oil around the world. The Marshall Islands ship registry is based in Virginia, just outside Washington, TV, Washington DC. Another problematic ship registry, St. Kitts and Nevis, that's based in Essex, just outside London. Now, these are not based in remote countries. They are deeply embedded in major Western economies. So you know, we need to look to ourselves really to sort this out. And, and that is going to cost some influential people in our country's money and cost uh, you know, some influential politicians you know, are gonna have to justify that. And that's gonna be a problem. But if we really actually want to solve the problem, we need to stop beating up on tax havens. Tax havens are just a function of globalization and start attempting to police the money in our own societies and far less worrying about what the Marshall Islands or Nevis are up to. Mm -hmm. And have you seen any countries shift, uh, including the UK? Do you think the UK has shifted a little bit? It has shifted a bit. Um, in, in the UK, we've seen uh, legislation uh, to impose transparency on the British Virgin Islands and the other um, overseas territories, which is which is good. Uh, new legislation about companies' house would help to possibly clean up the deeply problematic British corporate registry, which has been used to launder huge amounts of money, um, well, from everywhere to everywhere, really. But part of the problem is that, like globalization, this entire system of tax havenry is extremely entrepreneurial and very flexible. So as soon as Britain gets out of the game or Britain starts looking like it's going to get out of the game, the money just flows elsewhere. You know, Canada will offer the same products as Britain does. It might not be quite as cheap, but they do the same job. So you can just move and start routing money via shell companies in Alberta and you don't have to worry about Britain anymore. Um, we saw exactly the same after the great financial crisis, the crackdown on Switzerland. And there's a huge flow of money from Switzerland to South Dakota, Wyoming, Alaska and the other American wealth havens. So there is, as long as there's this demand, there will always be, you know, supply of tax havenry. And the question is just trying to reduce the space available to that. And, and that is a question for the major Western onshore economies, um, really, rather than to expect the tax havens to, to, you know, kill the golden goose, which is currently, you know, supplying them with lots of lovely eggs. Yeah, yeah. Well, lots of food for thought there. Thank you, Oliver, um, for that really interesting contribution. Um, so next, we're going to hear from Florentia Lorenzo. Um, she's a senior researcher at the Tax Justice Network, which, as the name says, uh, campaigns for uh, a fairer tax system. She's based in Brazil, and she's part of the core research team for the Financial Secrecy Index and the Corporate Tax Haven Index, which... Um, her organization produces. Um, Florencia, welcome and thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I've said a little bit about it, but would you talk us through Tax Justice Net Network's mission, what it what it does um, um, and uh, the kind of things that it produces? Yeah, sure. I'm just going to share my slides and start my presentation. Um, can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Florencia. I am, as you were mentioning, a senior researcher in the Tax Justice Network, which for those of you who don't know it, is, it's a network of activists and experts. It's, it was originally based on the UK, but we are now spread all over the world. Um, it was first established in 2003. So this is our 20 year anniversary. And as Juliette was mentioning, broadly speaking, our mission is to uh, work towards establishing a, a world which is 
where everyone can be in benefit from the from tech justice and this is understood in a broad sense as encompassing the many dimensions of tech justice as the role of taxation to fund uh, our public services but also as a tool for redistribution redistribution and also key in establishing uh, democratic and uh, accountable governments right because if you are tax you 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 engage with your government in the sense that you demand more representation. This is a, a historical slogan of uh, uh, political systems, right? The, the link between taxation and representation. And broadly speaking, our, our work uh, revolves around uh, those goals, right? Uh, but uh, maybe I can show you a bit some of um, of why we think we need to, to establish a bit uh, work towards tax justice as a, a big overarching goal. So uh, our research shows like that every year, $483 billion, that's almost half a trillion dollars, are lost to uh, the to tax abuse. And when we look at that, the composition of this abuse, we see that uh, 312 billion of those are lost due to tax abuse by multinationals, and 171 is lost to tax evasion by, by wealthy individuals. And and when we look at the big enablers of, of this abuse, right? What are, which are the jurisdictions or the countries that are creating this huge loss of revenue that could fund public services and uh, help us, for instance uh funding the the transition in the context of the climate crisis we see that we are not talking about as oliver was mentioning only like uh marginal uh small countries so, so uh small islands but that the vast majority of tax abuse is uh perpetrated and enabled but by uh by big countries. So if we look at our data, we're talking about 78% of the tax abuse is lost due to the enabling of rich countries. And in here I'm looking at OECD countries. And 40% uh, if we look at the countries that depend uh, are dependent territories and overseas territories of the UK, we're talking about 40% of those uh, losses are due are enabled by this this that we usually call the the uk spider web right so uh within the context of the discussion we are having today uh what makes a tax haven uh our response historically has been the development of our indices and these are two indices uh the financial secrecy index that we start, started publishing in 2009 and it's an index that ranks countries according to how much uh, they enable illicit financial flows according to the, their level of financial secrecy, but also uh, conjugating that analysis with how much financial exports they produce so we can have an actual uh, more, uh, more closely uh, correct picture to what is really happening. So, and the, the, the sister ranking that we started publishing in 2019 is the Corporate Tax Seven Index. And this one focuses more on which jurisdictions uh, play a, a role in facilitating corporate tax avoidance, right? So uh, with these two indices, we aim to basically present a, a, a picture of where and how is tax abuse and financial secrecy and illicit financial flows in a broad sense are being facilitated. And why do we, we take uh, an index approach? So this is a very big di discussion. It's both academic, uh, but also political, uh, as, as Oliver was mentioning, uh, and as Chiara um, show, will present briefly, I I shortly about this as well. The historically tax havens listings have have had uh, have suffered of like a very large influence, a political influence. So the countries that get included or not get included are not only due to their imp actual impact, but uh, oftentimes it's also related to 
the amount of political influence that they have in a specific context. So uh, these are two different approaches. And from the Tax Justice Network, we have historically adopted this idea of establishing indices, right? Because uh, so there are some pros and cons about doing this. Uh, if you're doing a list, you, you have a more of a clear, clear message and this can have more of an impact in, ter in terms of uh, causing behavioral change. But some of that clarity may be artificial. As we were saying, uh, financial secrecy and corporate tax abuse is not like a clear cut uh, separation, but it's often a spectrum. So uh, when we look to indices, we are, uh, try we are able to get a bit more of accuracy in looking into specific uh, legislation, but also the impact. Uh, with the, but this has also some limitations, right? But I think that one of the key points of doing indices and not uh, this is, is that this also highlights the fact that all countries, no matter how small or big they are, they can and should play a role in fighting illicit financial flows and uh, diminishing the scope that their laws allow for financial secrecy or corporate tax abuse. So just to give a very broad overview of how our indices work, they are composed of two dimensions, the first of which is an analysis of the legal frameworks, uh, which uh, for the corporate tax saving index is the Haven score, and the, for the financial secrecy index is the, finance, the secrecy scores, where we look at whether the country possesses loopholes in their jurisdiction that allows uh, wealthy individuals or big multinational corporations to avoid the rule of law, right? Uh, and then we combine this analysis of the legal frameworks with the global scale weight to see the scale of multinational activities in the countries in the co uh, when we're looking at the corporate tax seven index or the export of financial services when we're looking at the financial secrecy index. And why we do so? So basically one of the underlying uh, principles that we work with in the development of these two indices is that large financial centers with moderate loopholes facilitate more illicit financial flows than small financial centers with big loopholes. So this was something that Oliver was mentioning before, uh, the, the fact that historically a lot of these tax saving listings have focused only on small uh, countries that play a very limited role in facilitating illicit financial flows. So combining these two dimensions help us get a better picture of how uh, this tax abuse, but also the, the channeling of uh, funds of corruptions are being uh, facilitated throughout the world. So I'm not going to get into much detail for the, the two indices, but uh, just a broad overview of what do we analyze when we look at the legal framework for the corporate tax seven index. We have five dimensions. One, the first of it is looking at what is the lowest available corporate income tax rate that companies can enjoy because uh, countries have a statutory uh, corporate income tax rate, but oftentimes they can find corporations when they want to avoid taxes, they can find lower rates in the country through uh, some specific regimes, for instance. And then we look at loopholes and gaps. This includes uh, whether the country allows the losses to be utilized indefinitely to diminish, diminish the, 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 tax, uh, the tax rate paid by, by multinationals, whether there are broad exemptions that uh, multinationals can benefit of, and, and also looking at tax holidays. Then we look at the transparency component. This is also, as was mentioned already, uh, tax havens often ha have a lot of opacity to allow for, for, for lowering, lowering the, the rates. Uh, we look at whether countries in, uh, adopt anti-avoidance rules. And lastly, but not le less important, we look at the tax treaty network and how aggressive that is, because this is also a key component of uh, corporate tax abuse, right? The abuse of tax, the, the treaty uh, of double taxations, the, the network of double taxation treaty that countries have. 
And uh, just as a broad summary, and I'm sure Chiara will return to this, we look when we look at this data, we see a very different geography of tax abuse, right? So if we look at, for instance, the, 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 the example of the EU list, uh, we see that a lot of the, the biggest enablers of our both indices, the, both, the biggest enablers of corporate tax abuse, but also of financial secrecy, uh, almost the large majority of them are not included in the EU list, right? So this shows that, that we, uh, that there is a very big limitations in uh, other processes of blacklisting and, and trying to, to impact behavior in this sort because of the 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 un uh unproportional uh listing of the, the approach that they adopt and just to to finalize my presentation and uh, show to talk about some more uh positive and 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 good examples that we see in the current uh, context so i just want to mention two but we can come back uh later uh one the first of which is like the, the this big and exciting potentially legislation that australia is currently discussing which would introduce public country by country reported by all the multinationals that have subsidiaries in the country this could have like a, a game changing impact in the sense that if all companies multinationals that operate in australia have to publish the country by country reports uh this could have impacts for transparency throughout the world. And the second point that I want to highlight, which is also a key development, is the, the fact that we need to under, address the underlying structure. As, as Oliver was saying, uh, tax havering was, is not something that is disconnected to globalization and to the establishment of imperial or colonial or post-colonial orders so uh establishing more democratic and more inclusive forums to to address the issue of uh of tax abuse is a fundamental issue and here the the approval of a new and resolution to establish an intergovernmental to, to start discussing about an intergovernmental body to deal with tax issues was a a huge step uh so so like as as we were discussing all of these uh, measures that countries can take by themselves are really important, but we need to address the, the underlying structure that enables all of this abuse. If you want to read more, as I was saying, we just completely completed 20 years of existence and we published our uh, strategy. And this is, uh, broadly speaking, the platform, the policy platform that we have been advocating for. So the, that we usually call the ABC of tax transparency, uh, the implementation of domestic measures to ensure transparency, and then looking at some uh, international elements. I'm not going to go into detail into each one of those, but we can return afterwards. I'll stop here, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Florentia. And we'll come back to you with some questions later. Very interesting. Uh, I think it would be to hear more about the Australia country by country reporting. Um, so I'll make sure we get a question in about that at the end. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Chiara Putaturo, who is inequalities and tax policy advisor at Oxfam EU. Uh, she advocates for a fairer tax system uh, and for the mainstreaming of equality um, principles in, in EU policy making. Before Oxfam, she worked at Transparency International in Italy, uh, where she worked to raise awareness of anti-corruption and transparency in the public sector. Uh, so uh, welcome, Chiara. Um, and you're going to tell us a bit about Oxfam's mission and work and about these famous uh, EU tax haven lists. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, go I'm going also to share my screen. Just give me a few seconds. Okay, I hope you can see it. Yes, yes. okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so what I'm going to, to focus on is um, 
what is actually not a real tax haven, that is the uh, U-list uh, of tax haven, also known as, uh, officially known as list of non-cooperative jurisdiction. But before that, let me just explain, so why uh, Oxfam works, works on, uh, on that. Um, so our mission as, as Oxfam is to fight uh, inequality, to end poverty and, uh, and injustice. Uh, we tackle inequality from different perspectives. Uh, taxation is just one, uh, one of them. Uh, people ask me why uh, we work uh, on taxation and if the taxation can affect inequality in two main ways. One has been already mentioned and uh, at the beginning, uh, tax uh, can, uh, uh, can be used to, uh, to fund essential public services uh, that uh, the poor benefit uh, the most from, uh, so contribute um, to, to reduce inequality. They can uh, use to finance social protection or uh, reduce uh, for policies that re reduce, for example, gender inequality. And uh, the other aspect is the direct impact on, uh, on reducing inequality, because taxation can, um, can affect uh, the, the poorest the most, and in this case we have a regressive kind of taxation, or uh, the burden can go more on the, on the rich people, and we talk about progressive taxation. So in our um, inequality report that we published in January, um, we show how the, there was really an increase of the concentration of wealth in the last decade and uh, an explosion uh, in the last year since the pandemic. The richest 1% have captured nearly two thirds of all new wealth since 2020. And this is uh, nearly twice as much money as the rest of, uh, um, of humanity. There are different, but the of income and uh, and show you uh, in the in this slide uh, how the um, the corporate um, the corporate income tax uh, is contribute is contributed in the last uh, um, uh, in the last decade less and less uh, to uh, the um, to the GDP of of countries. Why other while other kind uh, of taxes they usually affect the, the poorest the most uh, have been uh, have been increasing in their contribution like labor taxes or uh, um, consumption uh, consumption taxes and uh, together with corporate income tax also wealth tax uh, that affect the, the richest of course the, the most uh, uh, hasn't hasn't increased uh, increased at all. Uh, so we work on corporate um, taxation at, at EU level to make corporations pay uh, their, their fair share. And this can have an impact not only on the EU, but also on poorer, on poorer countries. Uh, like Florencia has shown, uh, the, the poor um, tax avoidance uh, causes losses in poorer countries that are uh, higher compared to their, uh, to, to their GDP. Um, and so let me pass now to the EU tax saving list. Um, so this list exists since 2017, uh, is updated twice a year in February and uh, in October. Uh, and uh, the, um, it's divided into a blacklist uh, of countries that basically do not comply with, uh, uh, with sta certain standards and a gray list uh, uh, that is made of countries that committed to comply and they are given a certain amount of time to, uh, to comply. Currently there are 16 countries in the blacklist and 18 in the gray list. And what are the criteria the European Commission identified? The three main areas. Uh, tax transparency, in particular, in particular, they look at the exchange of information, fair taxation, they look at our harmful tax regimes. And the third area is about uh, some minimum standards uh, that were established by the, uh, the OECD to tackle um, base erosion and, and profits shifting. Um, and one important point that is also the main, one of the main problem is that this uh, list covers just a third countries, uh, so not European countries and uh, even not all third countries, currently 95 uh, countries are, uh, are covered. Um, and so just to um, 
um, like to produce the weaknesses uh, of, uh, of this list, uh, I can tell you that uh, only two of the worst 20 um, corporate tax havens ident identified by Tax Justice Network uh, are, uh, uh, are blacklisted in the, uh, in the EU list. And um, so there are four, um, let's summarize uh, them in four main uh, uh, weaknesses of, uh, of, the, of this list. So first of all, I already mentioned, uh, so the EU countries are not uh, listed or there are some countries that are too big to be listed, we say, uh, we say that. Uh, concerning the, uh, the EU countries, so we believe that there are uh, tax havens in the EU. Uh, and so we, we did some analysis uh, that uh, you, you can see in the, in the right graph, uh, looking at uh, the flows at the foreign direct in investment flows entering and exiting European countries. It also flows of so-called passive incomes. These are the interest, the dividends, and the royalties that uh, the different subsidiaries, parts of a corporation um, pay each other. Uh, and uh, we found out that this kind of flows are, uh, at least from uh, the data of 2020, they are really disproportionate in six uh, uh, European uh, uh, countries that are Cyprus, Hungary, Highland, Luxembourg, Malta, and Netherlands. In particular here on the right, you can see the intellectual property paid and received in Highland, Malta, Luxembourg, and Netherlands that are really high compared with the other European member states. And on the left, uh, you find in, uh, instead um, the representation of the dividends and interest flows um, that enter and exit Luxembourg. And this is a graph of the European Union uh, because it's true that the European Union uh, screened uh, European uh, member states. It produced some reports the European semester where they, um, they recognize that there are these disproportionate flows uh, of passive incomes and, and um, foreign direct investment. But uh, so these countries are not listed and there are not uh, real sanction against them. Uh, in addition to the fact that uh, they, um, they do not receive so much uh, exposure, public uh, um, uh, exposure. Um, and so this is uh, yeah, one of the, of the main weakness uh, in addition to the fact that, uh, for example, a country like the US that have um, a system of exchange of information that is quite weak uh, is, not, uh, is not screened. And according to us, if it was screened, it risked to not uh, meet the tax transparency uh, criteria. Um, and uh, also Malta is, um, is not, um, does not pass the tax transparency criteria. They didn't receive a, uh, like an optimal rating from the OECD but they are not screened and so they are not uh, uh, blacklisted. While Botswana for the same criteria, it's in the gray list and it, it risks to be blacklisted. Then the, um, the second weakness, um, it's related to uh, the, the criteria on harmful tax practices. And here I just mentioned one fact uh, that uh, having a zero tax rate is not sufficient for a country to be blacklisted. Uh, there are only four of the 20 countries uh, um, uh, of, that according to the OECD have a zero tax rate, only four of them are in the, uh, in the blacklist. And for example, Cayman Island, Highland of Man that have a zero tax rate on corporation, they, uh, they are not in the, in the blacklist. Then third point, there is um, an unfairness of the criteria. I mentioned that some of them, like the transparency of the OECD minimum standard, refer to, uh, to standards that were decided in the OECD, where in particular uh, low-income country did not have a say. And sometimes they don't have the capacity to implement these standards. So they are screened according uh, to standards that were decided some, somewhere else. Um, and for uh, there is also a lack uh, of, um, of transparency of the, of the procedure. There is a body in the um, Council of the EU uh, that um, deals with the, uh, with the tax haven list, with the list of non-cooperative jurisdictions, is the Code of Conduct Group, and is uh, one of the most secret uh, body. In particular, the minutes are not published, and we are not aware about the, the composition of the, of the group. 
So uh, just to, to conclude what we would like uh, to, uh, to see happen, what are our recommendations? Um, so first of all, we would like to, um, to have the same screening also for, uh, for European countries. So even higher standard and higher visibility for, uh, for them. We would like uh, stronger um, criteria in particular related to harmful tax practice um, and uh, in particular uh, blacklist uh, countries that um, have a zero tax rate uh, automatically. Uh, but also introduce a criteria related, related to the beneficial ownership transparency that is still uh, not there. Um, then we ask to not blacklist, uh, blacklist in countries that do not comply with the OECD uh, standard and also to make this body, the Code of Conduct Group, the, the body that deals with the, with the blacklist, more, uh, more transparent. Uh, I have to admit that there were little improvements, like in the transparency of this body, they make an effort to publish more uh, information, or if we look, for example, at the OECD tax level list, uh, it is currently empty. So the EU tax level list, at least, uh, he, it, has, uh, it has more country in it. And um, also the, the beneficial ownership um, criteria is in the pipeline. So it will be, uh, it will be included and, so, and also the European Commission, we know that he, um, they want to, to introduce more countries and I hope the US and also the UK will be screened. Uh, but uh, it has to be seen if the member states uh, uh, agree. And uh, my really last point, uh, so in, in addition to the EU tax savings list, there are other reforms the European Union is, uh, is engaging in. And just to, to mention some, there is a reform on uh, to limit the use of shell companies that are um, that are used by, by corporation for tax avoidance uh, purposes. And uh, the, the European Commission is also, um, uh, has also planned uh, to, to table a reforms to um, make more difficult for tax professionals to enable tax avoidance practices. And also another uh, reform called uh, in uh, European abbreviation BFIT that basically will uh, tax corporation according to where they have the real economic activity. And this should make tax avoidance practices less difficult. But of course, it all, uh, these are all reforms that are in the pipeline. And uh, at the end of the day, it's up to the EU countries to, to, vote, uh, to vote on them. Uh, so yeah, I'm finished here and happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Fantastic, thank you, Chiara. And, and I'll come back to you, I know you touched on it, but I'll, I'll come back to you to ask a bit about why should we care who's on the EU tax haven list? What and difference does it make, you know, to be on that list? Um, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll come back uh, to you on that. So I'd like to give Jamie um, a chance to uh, talk before we go on to the question and answer session. Um, so Jamie is head of accreditation at the Fair Tax Foundation. So he is the policeman who goes through companies' books and processes um, uh, to um, work with them um, on applying for the fair tax mark. Um, and he deals with small companies, right up to FTSE listed firms and even global multinationals now. Um, and, um, uh, and he also supports the development of the standards that are applied through the fair tax mark. Um, he's a poacher turned gamekeeper. Um, he comes from an accounting and taxation background and he's worked for a range of accountancy firms from small family businesses to one of the top 10. Um, so Jamie, uh, you're going to tell us uh, a bit about the work that um, the Fair Tax Foundation does. Um, and can you tell us briefly how you, you came to be involved? Um, <laughs> it was just a it was just a, a bit of luck to be honest. Yeah, it was just um, a calling really. I, I was thrilled when I got the uh, the job to work at the Fair Tax Foundation and do work on the other side, the light side of you know the ethical practices revolved around uh, taxation. Yeah. Um, and uh, did you uh, apply for a job or were you, did you get a tap on the shoulder and um, uh, it's a, a, a request to come and sign up? 
as with most uh, jobs these days, it was through a friend, actually. A friend uh, said, this is just right up your street. And were there things that you saw that made you think I'd like to I'd like to swap sides? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I, I, I kind of seen what was going on in the accountancy world, and although many many accountants do do the right thing, there were instances of things that you could say you know you weren't necessarily overly comfortable with, or you thought that this isn't really the right thing to do, especially in terms of like you know, the global aspect of things. And I suppose you could, you know, take a stand within within the companies and the profession uh, in your advisory work, but what made you think it would be more effective to come and join uh, the fair tax mark process? It's just, it's just very, very niche. And I just think, you know, in terms of tax, you know, I think the common uh, approach or uh, the common understanding of tax is that it's a bad thing and that it should be minimized and no one really wants to pay it. But I think, you know, the narrative is changing and I think there needs to be a big voice for the other side of stuff that tax actually is a good thing. You know, you're paying taxes because you have been successful and it does go towards the things like infrastructure and public services that we all rely on. And so it was just to put a bit of power behind that side of stuff, you know, and, and fight the good fight really. Yeah. Um, and so tell me a bit about um, how tax havens uh, form a part of the accreditation process, how, how, how are you looking at these in the context of the, the companies that you're advising? Well, I've got a, a little bit of a speech planned, so I don't know whether to... Yeah, yeah. And uh, hopefully that will answer everything. So just to expand on my background a little bit more and why it fits in with the work that we do and what we're talking about today, because I come from both an accounting and taxation background and because I have worked for both big and small accountancy firms, this has enabled me to see more of a complete picture when it comes to, one, the differences between the tax practices of big businesses versus small. They each have their own things to look out for. And two, the differences between what's being reported externally via the accounts and what's actually going on behind the scenes and with the tax authorities. So working for big and small in tax and accounts, it's given me a well-rounded view of these things. I've got some good stuff to share with you all today. So hopefully I can fit it all in with these last 10 minutes that I've got before. Just last week, we released our new and updated tax haven list. And I'll be talking about how this list was drawn up and also why tax havens form an important part of our accreditation process and how we incorporate them into our assessments with maybe some examples of the good, the bad, and the ugly at this time. Uh, so at this point in the webinar, we know, or I hope that we know, that certain jurisdictions can be abused in order to minimize, avoid, or even evade taxes. So what is a tax haven? So many people think a tax haven is simply a country or jurisdiction that doesn't impose any taxes on income generated there, or more importantly, income shifted there. There is truth in this, but there are also other factors at play. So other factor number one is secrecy. Secrecy jurisdictions make it difficult to track the flow of money, and therefore the people or entities behind the scenes receiving the monies. This makes it difficult or sometimes even impossible to tax them properly, if at all. These types of jurisdictions often act as hubs for illicit financial flows, and good examples would be the United Arab Emirates and the US Virgin Islands. Other well, factor number two, harmful tax incentives. Some jurisdictions actually have decent tax rates, but, and it is a big but, these are then undermined by the artificial and aggressive tax incentives that they offer. When I say artificial or aggressive tax incentives, I mean they are easily abused without the need for any real genuine economic activity. And these are the types of jurisdictions that encourage artificial offshore structures and profit shifting. You could say Russia and Barbados are examples of these. And finally, other factor number three, uncooperative jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions don't really comply with international good practice, and some have even refused to do so. A lack of international cooperation makes it difficult to combat money laundering and tax evasion. 
And it also makes it difficult, difficult to close the loopholes that allow these types of abuse. A classic example of this would be the British Virgin Islands. So then our tax haven list, our lovely friends at the Tax Justice Network, as demonstrated earlier, have developed two indexes, which were updated every two years. One is the Corporation Tax Haven Index, which is a ranking of the most complicit jurisdictions in helping multinational corporations underpay corporate income tax. And the other is the Financial Secrecy Index, which is an index ranking countries based on how much financial secrecy they supply to the world. And both of these indexes have played a major part in us developing our new and updated tax haven listing. Other resources that have contributed to our list have been Oxfam and their general research and interventions into this area, European Union's list of non-cooperative jurisdictions, and the OECD's harmful tax practices peer review. So our tax haven listing is on our website. It's an extensive list and it consists of 71 jurisdictions, each of which fit into at least one of the contributing factors towards deemed tax haven status. However, it is worth noting that every jurisdiction in the world has its pros and cons. And just because a country isn't on the list doesn't mean that it's a saint by any means. So now that we've got our deemed tax haven jurisdiction list, what do we at the Fair Tax Foundation do with it and why is it important to us? So let's first address why it's important to us. So we accredit businesses that have responsible tax practices that are pioneers in financial transparency and which pay the right amount of tax and importantly for this in the right places. If a multinational business is artificially shifting its profits to tax havens, then it won't be paying the right taxes or to the right countries and therefore would not be eligible for the fair tax market accreditation. This type of unethical and aggressive behaviour to shift profits artificially means countries are losing out on tax revenues, which could otherwise be used to fund public services and infrastructure. This can then lead to other people footing the bill instead like smaller or more local businesses and the resident citizens there, which then contributes to the growing global inequality crisis as well. The infamous stat on multinational profit shifting that we often hear is just crazy to me, so much so that I have to break it into two parts for it to be fully appreciated. First part is close to 40% of multinational profits are artificially shifted to tax havens each year. 40% artificially shifted every single year. And this leads to, it, is, it equates to about $970 billion worth of artificial profit shifting. And then the second part is, and this leads to a $250 billion reduction in corporate income tax revenue or 10% of global corporate tax receipts. 10% of global corporate tax receipts, $250 billion gone. And sometimes businesses will even use a combination of tax havens to shuffle money around the globe and exploit loopholes. Google was an example of this in the past, using what was dubbed a double Irish and Dutch sandwich, after which then landed in a zero tax jurisdiction like Bermuda. And the Paradise Papers leaks even shown instances of corporate profits becoming stateless from a tax perspective and only came to light through a data leak. It just goes to show the importance of transparency and international cooperation to make sure systems run efficiently and when those fail the importance of whistleblowers and journalists. However, and this is a big however, not all businesses are bad and not all presences in these deemed tax haven jurisdictions are for shady purposes. Many respectable businesses have genuine commercial operations in these deemed tax haven jurisdictions, underpinned by legitimate economic activity, and these types of businesses should not be condemned for simply being in these jurisdictions and acting in good faith. So then, how do we determine which businesses are in these jurisdictions aggressively to find clever little loopholes and artificially minimise their taxes? in contrast to the businesses which have a genuine commercial and economic presence in these places, with profit, profits being declared and tax paid where real value is being added. One way of doing this is by simply asking the questions, what are your reasons for being in that jurisdiction? What is each company's function there? What are their purposes for existing there? And you'll be surprised what you'll find out by just asking the question. 
Another way would be to look into a business's economic footprint across each jurisdiction it operates within, more commonly known as country by country reporting, as mentioned earlier. Country by country reporting shows things like sales, staff, profits, assets and taxes on a country by country basis. And having all this data split out where we can analyze and compare it, it can be really telling. It can really shine a light on artificial tax haven presence and abuse. And on the contrary, for the more ethical businesses, it can do the opposite and support their ethical tax practices, their responsible tax commitments and transfer pricing policies to their stakeholders. When it comes to us providing an accreditation, we have to satisfy ourselves that any presences within these deemed tax haven jurisdictions on our list is driven by genuine commercial reasons and underpinned by legitimate economic activity. And more importantly, that taxes are being paid where value is added. The Fair Tax Foundation is not like many other accreditation schemes. It isn't a self-certifying process and we don't assess businesses, say, every three years. We independently assess all of our accredited organisations each and every year. And in terms of tax havens, we actively look into the jurisdictions that each of our organisations operate within. All of our accredited multinational businesses voluntarily publish their country by country reporting showing where they pay their taxes and showing their commitment towards transparency, accountability and respons responsible tax conduct. So just to wrap up before I finish very quick, there are many things to consider when determining whether a jurisdiction is or isn't a potential tax haven. Fortunately, we do this every year from the wonderful data and research of others, i.e. the Tax Justice Network and Oxfam, and we host this list on our website. By knowing what makes a tax haven, it means we also know where our efforts should go towards stopping the artificial abuse of them, and the movement in this space is picking up pace. The OECD BEPS is already well on the way with a global minimum tax and trying to apportion profits so that they are taxed in the places of genuine economic substance rather than just where they land or are placed, meaning the use of tax havens should become less attractive and less beneficial. Public country by country reporting is also in the spotlight lately, as highlighted earlier again, with Australia having actually drafted legislation for multinational enterprises to publicly disclose tax data on a country by country basis, as well as their approach to taxation. The more countries that make public country by country reporting mandatory, the less likely a multinational business is to artificially shift profits and abuse tax haven jurisdictions, as happened with the European banking sector when this became mandatory for them. And just before I finish, I'd just like to thank all of our fair tax market accredited businesses that go above and beyond what they are legally required to do, because they are pioneers for responsible tax conduct and tax transparency. They are all collectively working towards better and fairer societies and economies. And I'd also like to personally thank the audience for being here today at this Fair Tax Foundation webinar and for taking the time to listen to me and everybody else on the panel. It means a lot to us. And now I'll hand it back over to you, Julia. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention that um, we've had some uh, questions come in about whether the presentation slides will be available afterwards. Um, and uh, and so long as Chiara and Florencia are happy to share their slides, I think we can share them around afterwards. So please uh, email us and let us know um, if you'd like to have them. Um, so uh, we've got time for some questions now uh, before we conclude at, at half past one. Um, uh, so far, far away, we have a few that have already come in. Um, and uh, I have um, I have two really good ones to start with. Um, one from Maxine Sadza, who is asking whether free ports are considered to be tax havens, and if not, what's the difference? Um, I might put this one to Oliver, if that's okay, if you feel um, comfortable answering that. Um, and uh, Maxine is also asking um, why are uh, free ports susceptible to corrupt practices, if indeed they are, and how can councils uh, try to pursue transparency? We've obviously got quite a few concerns around um, time we're at the moment, um, so we might need to be a bit careful 
example of what we say, but free ports, are they tax havens, Oliver? So, in, I mean, in general, anywhere that has different, looser regulations on taxation or accountability or transparency is susceptible to being used as a tax haven in some way or another. That's just the nature of these things. Um, the precise way they're going to be used in the UK, I think it's probably a bit too early to say, but certainly free ports, as we have seen them in uh, Switzerland and Singapore and elsewhere, um, as they tend to be used more as a sort of bonded warehouse, um, but which is both inside Switzerland or, or Singapore and, and yet not at the same time in that something can be in the boundaries of the country, but without the regulations of the country applying. They've been absolutely crucial for um, dodging taxes via the movement of, of fine art, uh, via the movement of commodities, um, because, you know, you are essentially able to use a bit of Switzerland or a bit of Singapore as a, as a stash in place for goods or property without having to declare who owns it or having to pay any tax on it. So the, a lot of, you know, art transactions, these big, very, very sort of expensive art transactions, the, the, the painting or sculpture won't actually leave the Freeport. It just stays there and someone buys it and someone else sells it. So the, the, the money is moved without any oversight over the ownership of it at all. It's essentially just moving a painting from one box to another. Um, will the British freeports be used in that way? No, because that's not how they're going to be used. However, um, the fact that you have a bit of Britain with less oversight and less regulations than another bit of Britain naturally will uh, appeal to people who don't like regulations and oversight. And sadly, that's quite often the kind of people who use tax havens. Yeah, very good point. Um, and uh, as I understand it, uh, free ports will have benefits such as no national insurance contributions, no stamp for the first few years on employees employed within the zones and no uh, stamp duty to pay on property transactions. Um, so exactly what Oliver is saying, that there will be, you know, there'll be a difference in the tax treatment of companies and employees even working within those zones and those working in the rest of the country. Um, uh, if uh, Just back to the slides issue, um, if you would like a copy of the slides, email Nora at fairtaxmark.net. I thought there were some really interesting figures there, so you might want to uh, send her a message. Um, uh, next question um, is from Stuart Redaway. Um, and Stuart's asking um, whether the Isle of Man is a tax haven. Varenthia, does the Isle of Man fit within your definition at TJN? So, so I, as I always mentioned, I just want to make one comment on the Freeport question. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, so Freeports are actually one of the components we analyze for the Financial Secrecy Index, for a Secrecy Indicator 4, which, com which comprises of what we call other wealth ownership. We analyze both if like the, the country has a public real estate register where information about real, real estate ownership can be found. But also we look if the country promotes or, or has free ports. And this is because uh, uh, not free ports can be used not only for, for tax abuse, that's one dimension, but uh, to, to create opacity around the ownership of other wealth. And if we're looking, for instance, at, at countries that have implemented wealth taxes, this plays a huge role. But also this has implications as we were discussing earlier not only for tax, but illicit financial flows can be used to channel all, all sorts of you know, gain, uh, illicit gains. So, so free ports uh, can play a role in that and have played a role in that in, in many cases. And on the listing, so, so I, as I was mentioning before, the, the, we currently, the, the tax, tax Justice Network does not work we don't publish lists, tax savings lists, we publish rankings uh, because we believe that all countries play, uh, uh, can play a role in, uh, in facilitating financial, um, illicit financial flows. Uh, currently, uh, the, the, the Isle of Man in the Financial Secrecy Index is not on, on one of the main enablers it's uh it's ranked 61 so it, it even though it has like it can play a role it, it's not one of the ones that plays a bigger role in, in, in enabler financial secrecy 
but it plays a bigger role in our corporate tax haven index. It's currently uh, the 20th jurisdiction that, that plays the biggest role in enabling corporate tax abuse, according to, to our analysis. And this is, uh, of course, if we look at the size of development, this represents a very important uh, role. So yeah, if we compare the size to, to its impact in the world economy, it's pretty big. <laughs> Um, and uh, can you tell us a few of the characteristics that make it a secrecy or a, a, a tax haven zone? No, so, so, yeah, so I, as I was mentioning, it doesn't play. We have these two rankings, which are like a bit different. The financial secrecy index, which relates at, at how much uh, financial secrecy the country enables. And the Isle of Man is not one of the biggest enablers in, in our analysis. We see countries such as the U.S., or Switzerland playing a much bigger role in this respect. But when we look at, at corporate tax abuse, uh, which jurisdictions enable multinationals to avoid paying their fair uh, share of taxes, uh, the Isle of Man plays a bigger role. And as I was mentioning, I, I can make no uh, comments on the specifics, but our analysis comprises about five dimensions, uh, the, the, the lowest available corporate income tax that co that companies located and can uh, pay the, the amount of transparency, the network of double taxation treaties that can be misused to, to avoid paying taxes. And we combine this analysis of the legal framework to the actual uh, scale okay. of multinational uh, activities in the countries, which is fairly big. Right, thank you. So, and, and Oliver, um, on the Isle of Man, just briefly, um, there have been some efforts, haven't there, to improve transparency um, among the UK Crown dependencies about who owns what companies. Um, ha have those flowed through yet on the Isle of Man? Is that um, but there's some ticking on, and um, there's been a, a bit of a spanner was thrown in the works by the European uh, Court of Justice's decision at the end of last year to delay or end. Um, the corporate transparency part of their own anti-money laundering directive, which led to the various British territories saying it wouldn't be fair if they had to essentially follow through with that as well. Um, there was a you know a real disappointment. Um, you know, the Isle of Man, it would say it isn't a tax haven. Um, you know, it isn't one of the worst, I suppose. But essentially, if you look at how it makes a living, um, you know, it's a rock in the middle of the Irish Sea. It, you know, it, it's seen that being able to essentially attract money that would otherwise end up in the UK is a profitable way of earning fees for its professional enablers that makes it a tax haven so whatever it says really i mean it may not be one of the worst ones but it it, it still very much is i mean it is i would say possibly one of the tax havens with the worst weather um it's unusual in that regard they tend to have better weather than the isle of man um so you know that's something as well uh it's not all palm trees yes but um a beautiful place nonetheless it's gorgeous but still rainy <laughs> Um, and uh, by the way, um, if any of the panel would like to pitch in, please raise a hand or um, type type into the um, message um, board, and um, and I'll come to you um, uh, on on particular questions. Um, so next, um, Richard Watts uh, is asking um, whether the role of powerful countries and individuals. Uh, um, uh, well, he's saying thank you to, 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 for outlining the role of powerful countries and individuals in creating tax havens. Um, it's been interesting to see the recent UK Economic Crime Act um, passed into law and the high visibility of reducing illicit, illicit financial flows. Um, has any analysis been conducted uh, on, on the impact of this act? Plus, how much is the issue about appropriate say legalization versus enforcement uh, um, of, of interest. Um, um, that was for Oliver, but I might just come to Jamie on that actually, um, just so we have hear from a variety of people. I think you might be muted. Sorry, Juliet, could you repeat that again, sorry? Just... Oh yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, it's a question about the uh, UK Economic Crime Act. Has it had an impact? Uh, well, it's not. It's not really coming to force yet. I think what's 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 going to be coming into force is. Obviously, you've got the public register of assets, but 
I think the big one for us would be the transparency of all companies, regardless of size. I think eventually when that comes down the line and we start and we start seeing that it can it can really shine a light on uh, harmful harmful tax practices. I, I I know I don't know through stats, but I know through experience that just as much, if not more, um, tax evasion or you know aggressive tax practices come from small businesses as well, and they get this. Um, leeway of not being able to not having to report all of their income and profits and taxes and i think just the fact of that would change direction in terms of onshore and for smaller businesses yeah great um i think yeah i think it's the economic crime act number two that's going through parliament at the moment so i don't know if there's an, an earlier one but um I'm, uh, I'm uh, not the expert. Uh, but last um, year's last year's Economic Crime Act was intended to prevent the misuse of offshore or overseas owned companies to hold UK property anonymously. Um, you know, which was welcome, but also solving a problem that was sort of already not such a big problem anymore. A far bigger problem is the use of offshore trusts to own UK property, which this hasn't dealt with. Um, I mean, so much of the issue has been sort of slow and dilatory response by the UK authorities when they often respond to problems years after they, they were first alerted to them. And then when they do respond to them, they just pass legislation and then don't actually give the law enforcement bodies any any uh, resources that they need to tackle the problem. Um, you know, and, and it, it's you know, a company's house which will be tasked for for looking after the, the, the new law, which is supposed to clean up Britain's corporate registry, simply doesn't have the money it needs to do the job being asked of it. Um, you know, at the moment, buying a British company costs about twelve pounds. Um, you know, really, if you want to properly police the registry, that price will need to go up to about fifty pounds or hundred, maybe. Um, you know, there's no sign that the government is prepared to grasp that particular nettle because it doesn't want to be seen as being anti-business, even though in this case, being anti-business is more like being pro-fraud, um, which is absurd. Um, but we see the same problem with the National Crime Agency, which, despite having very low um, resourcing isn't even able to fill the posts that it has it's sort of understaffed by 20 or 25 percent just because it, it's got a big you know staff turnover the same problem with serious fraud off it's the same problem with city police so you know there is a it's not really a legislation problem in the uk the legislation that's not perfect is pretty good by international standards um it's an enforcement problem um you know when we do get a powerful new tool that could help tackle tax evasion or or more likely kleptocracy uh, it, it just isn't used because there's no one really available to use it uh, Florentia, the uh, United States is better than we are at enforcement, I would say. Um, you know, you can have um, a pretty successful, well-paid, high-profile career as um, a public enforcer within the Department of Justice. Um, and so they do attract genuine talent and they do act a bit as a global police uh, force uh, on fraud and money laundering. Um, and so, but, so, so, uh, but, but we also have a problem in the US uh, in that we have these um, uh, onshoring uh, tax havens, you know, like Delaware and Wyoming. Um, so, uh, can you talk us through what the the, the US the benefits to, to global tax from the US, but also the the drawbacks and why why the country's approach seems to be a bit schizophrenic on this point. You know, you've got Biden looking at trying to encourage multilateral tax agreements and strong law enforcement, but um, then you uh, you know senators are doing nothing about Wyoming and Delaware. And that's for Florentia. Uh, yeah, no, I think that the, the US is a very complex case in, in, in several of the uh, motives that you already mentioned. There is like a lot of difference between like different states and so on. But what we do know is that uh, overall there is a very, uh, there is very weak federally enforced uh, regulations for corporate transparency. So for uh, in 2000 and in 21, they approved the Corporate Transparency Act, which was supposed to establish beneficial ownership registration uh, for companies that operate that are created in the US. But uh, the, the legislation is full of loopholes. You have like so many companies that would stand, uh, stay outside of the scope of registration, and this information would not even be made public. 
So, um, and then, then we also have another issues, uh, like when we look, for instance, at automatic exchange of information, which is another dimension that we analyze. The, the US played a role, a very important role in normalizing the automatic exchange of information with the implementation of the Foreign Accounting Tax Compliance Act, which was uh, approved in 2010, which required uh, foreign um, institutions like banks to, to report uh, information of the bank accounts of Americans living abroad, uh, that had bank accounts abroad. But uh, when this became more normalized and it became more of a global system, the, the, the Common Reporting Center, uh, which was established within the OECD, the US did not uh, uh, adhere to that standard. So currently there is a lot, uh, it doesn't reciprocate uh, fully when we're talking about bank accounts. So, so a lot of countries, uh, and especially when we look at low-income countries, they have to send information of uh, Amer American residents that have bank accounts in their countries, but they don't receive any information of their own residents that have bank accounts in the U.S. So it's a very um, unequal mm. system, right? Uh, they are receiving way more information that they are sending. So I think that this also builds upon on some of the issues that we were discussing before about how we cannot look at these issues without taking into account uh, how some of this, um, this tax abuse and this uh, enabling of illicit financial flows builds upon power structures, right? Because in some ways, uh, the US, which is one of the, if not the most powerful country in the world and could be sharing way more information that it has, it currently has, it's not doing so. And a lot of this has to do of like they're, they're, they're protecting some of their, their own uh, businesses that are uh, actually enabling this illicit financial flows. So yeah, I think uh, recognizing the role that the country has played, uh, it's crucial and uh, a lot needs to be addressed for it to, to be more fair. Like we, we need solutions to these issues that are not only bring transparency, but create more fairness as well. Thank you. Um yeah, yeah can I shift the uh, focus to the EU, uh, which you've obviously looked at very closely. Do you think there has been a change in recent years in public opinion about tax havens and tax evasion within the EU? And are we seeing that translate into uh, directives and measures uh, across, across the zone? Yeah, so I think that there has been a shift. I mean, there is more an understanding of what is happening also thanks uh, to the uh, to the scandals and, uh, and the leaks. And we, we have to admit that the European Commission have been more active in the last years on the, uh, on the topic, even with uh, legal, uh, legal limitations. Also, the European Parliament has, um, has been very vocal. They uh, even have uh, admitted that there are European tax havens. Uh, so for sure there is. Um, and maybe in these last years, uh, the, um, the public uh, opinion also um, became I mean, more aware of the um, inequality that there is, uh, but also where the, the money is, because I mean, we are all asking also in the, in the member states uh, for, uh, for money to repay for the recovery, but also for the climate change. And uh, we have really to look uh, where the, the money is, uh, where the wealthy individuals are, but also uh, in, uh, in corporation, uh, in the windfall profit, but also in the tax avoidance of corporations. So we can't, uh, politicians can't continue to, uh, to lie. Uh, of course, we need uh, still more transparency. Florencia mentioned the public country by country reporting by Australia. In the EU, a partial public country by country reporting will be introduced, covering only EU countries and uh, uh, the countries in the blacklist, so very limited. But if we really could have access to how much corporation pay in each uh, country in the world, then, then the, the problem would be even more clear to the uh, to the citizens. So yeah, I think there is uh, more public uh, um, um, uh, pressure on that, but more uh, more is needed. More is needed. 
Um, and, and what what is the point of the EU list? Is it that you know a government can't do business with a country, can't uh, not do business, but can't accept financial flows from a, a company registered in that country? Or how does it? How yeah. Does it, so since the beginning, how should it work? Yeah, so since the beginning, there are some uh, uh, limitation in terms of some European funds, for example, uh, the European Fund for Sustainable Development or for Strategic Investment, so they are not allowed to be uh, to be used in, this, in these countries. Then uh, from 2021, the member states were asked to introduce the, some, uh, um, some defensive measures that basically uh, try to, um, to, to stop profit uh, going towards the blacklisting countries untaxed. So the, um, if a corporation want to shift profit to a blacklisted country, they have, um, uh, they have first to be taxed in the EU. And the same for uh, the kind of flows that I was mentioning before, the interest, the royalties, the dividends, they have to be paid first in the EU and then uh, they can be shifted to, um, to countries in the blacklist. But um, I mean, as I said, uh, the, the, the blacklisted countries are still uh, a few limited. And it is enough to say that there are countries that are there since the beginning, really, of the, of the list. So probably this kind of measure were not effective uh, enough. Right, right. Thank you. Um, Becky Dwyer is asking um, Jamie if uh, there are any particular industries that are more likely to use tax havens, or is it just kind of the size of the company that determines the enthusiasm for it? Um, it can be. A combination of factors. Obviously, more domestic businesses don't really need to use tax havens. Although you know you could argue that some domestic ones do use. You know, the uh, the like the Isle of Man and and then Jersey and them kind of things that are, that are UK based. But the proper multinationals are really the only ones that could really shift money around and and think in, depending on what industry they're in. Sometimes there's common norms of what they do, you know, with the tech companies, sometimes there's common norms of what they kind of do and the pharmaceutical companies like that. Um, sometimes it just depends on where they're based, you know, if they're based in America, they might use a certain way. If they're based in the UK, they might use another way. If they're based in Europe, another way. Um, so the, there is no real, there's trends, but I wouldn't say there's a there's a there's a rule of like this is what happens. And obviously, as as pointed out earlier uh, by by Oliver, when when rules tighten and things change, you know the whole system and structure can change anyway to to get the best out of that then situation. So yeah, yeah, yeah. One one thing I would say on that is that using these structures and services is quite expensive. Um, you know, the lawyers and accountants required to create a sort of a uh, an, an effective tax haven system is quite expensive. So, you know, this is only available to people that can afford it. It's a sort of, um, you know, first class citizen, which is if you can pay the entrance fee, then you get severe benefits, but it isn't available to the rest of us. Um, and, and that I think is is one of the reasons and totally underpinning all the excellent points everyone's been making about the unfairness of this, that you have a, you know, preferential treatment for the, for the, for the wealthy and not for everyone else, which seems, yeah, well, it is regressive. That's the problem, right? Yeah. Um, on that point, and uh, touching on on your most recent book, Oliver Aidan Regan is asking about the those who enable um, uh, this uh, offshoring of profits and personal wealth. Um, uh, do do how do they? Um, I'm asking how do they do what they do, but also what can be done about it? Do they have a role? You know, do the industry bodies have a role? Does training have a role in trying to fix this? Well, it's a really interesting question, and and I think that there is a degree of um, that we can see some successes in the past in the tackle against particular kinds of tax evasion. Um, for example, um, what's called carousel fraud was a particularly complex form of VAT fraud uh, enabled within the EU just because of how VAT works. Um, if you look at how that was tackled, it, it it isn't something that can be solved with a single measure or by a single agency. It has to be a combination of um, you know, regulatory changes, you know, police work, diplomatic work, political work. And unless you've got all those pieces in place, then success is impossible. 
And I think that the issue, and I think why, why I'm so delighted to be on this call and why I think that it's so brilliant that the work, you know, all the others have been doing and why, you know, the whole fair tax market is such a great idea is that without pressure from below, um, politi politicians aren't going to care. You know, they, they, you know, they talk to enablers, though they don't call them that all the time. You know, these are the people that, that, you know, they go to dinner parties with who give them donations and they're very happy with the situation as it currently is. It's great for them. Um, it's very profitable and it's only bad for the rest of us. And unless we make our voice heard as loudly or more loudly than, you know, the enablers are able to make their voice heard via, you know, exclusive dinners with or tennis matches with our um, dear leaders, then, you know, we're never going to get anywhere. So it, it's fantastic, the work that Oxfam does and, and, and the Tax Justice Network and, and fair, tax, um, um, fair Tax Mark on companies is, is just brilliant. And the more of this, the better, frankly. Well, that was actually a really lovely summing up and um, we are nearly out of time. Um, but I just want to say thank you all to each of our brilliant panelists, to Oliver, Florencia, Cara, Chiara and Jamie. Uh, we've learned a lot today. Um, so interesting. 40% of multinational profits are shifted offshore. I'm still slightly reeling from that number. $480 billion a year in taxes lost. This is a big issue and we will return to it. Thank you so much.